Good morning. I am Beth Allison Barr, and it is so my privilege to introduce my friend, Dr. Jamar Tisby, this morning. And I've told several people that this conference this weekend has felt more like all my friends coming here um, because it is so wonderful to be with people who you have been in the trenches with for a while. And Jamar Tisby has been in the trenches of fighting racism for as long as I have known him. And in fact, before, because I'm not sure if he knows this, but in 2016, I read a New York Times op-ed. And I thought, I need to know that man. Um, two years later, he was the um, keynote speaker at a conference that I was helping to organize. And in that talk, he had a room full of undergraduate students. And he laid out not only why he had become a historian, but how he had become a historian to have the tools to fight racism. And in that talk, he impressed upon me the need as Christians to not just listen, but to act. So Jamar Tisby is here because he is putting his words to action. We all know him as the New York Times bestselling author of The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the Church's Complicity in Racism, as well as the New York Times bestseller, How to Fight Racism, which he has also produced a young reader's edition of, which is so critical as we think about the next generation and helping them grow up with the tools to fight racism. Jamar has been the co-host of Pass the Mic podcast since before podcasts were really popular. Um, it's a lot of fun. I strongly encourage you to put it on your read list. His writing has been featured everywhere, including the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and the New York Times. He is a frequent commentator on outlets such as NPR and CNN's New Day program, and he speaks nationwide on topics of racial justice, U.S. history, and Christianity. He earned his PhD in history. He studies race, religion, and social movements in the 20th century. He also is the author of a one of my, actually it's the first substack I ever subscribed to, called Footnotes, which I absolutely love as a historian. And then, as we will talk about more in our conversation this morning, he is most recently professor of history at Simmons College, um, a historically black college in Louisville, Kentucky. So it is my honor to welcome Jamar Tisby to the stage. I've often said that if you persist in racial justice in predominantly white spaces for long enough, you either get pushed out, burned out, or sell out. If you persist in racial justice in predominantly white spaces long enough, you get pushed out, burned out, or sell out. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Sell out. This stuff is hard. Kicking against the goads, as the Bible would say. And there are many times for survival's sake, or just getting fed up and frustrated, that, that you might decide it's not worth it. There's a lot of other things I can be focused on and constantly bringing up this topic of racial justice is, is frustrating, it's challenging, things aren't moving. So you know what? Let me, uh, let me acquiesce to the status quo. Let me assimilate. 
let me take the path of least resistance, which is also often more profitable. Chill out. Or you get burned out. In, in the medical field, there's, there's this idea pioneered by a black woman called weathering. Now, weathering is a geological term, talking about erosion over time, but in this case, it, weathering means the wear and tear on your body and mind due to the constant stress of racism. Did you know that this stuff is, 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 has physiological effects? It can lead to depression, it can lead to hypertension, it can even lead to spiritual hardships. And if you're in these predominantly white settings constantly talking about racial justice, it takes a toll on your body, on your mind, on your spirit. And I know people who have just broken down. Burnout. I want to speak to you today about being pushed out. So if you talk about racial justice in predominantly white spaces long enough, eventually you'll cross a line where it becomes more costly to keep you than to find a way for you to leave. Sometimes you know where that line is, sometimes you don't. But institutions are self-protective. They want to conserve what they've got and build and grow on what's working, and typically a controversial subject like racial justice isn't the way to grow fastest, to sustain. And so, whether it's through a firing or you get locked out of the important committees or meetings, whether it's through uh, being socially shunned, you get pushed out. You get burned out, you sell out or pushed out. So the topic for this talk that I was given is racism, repair, and the church. But since I'm a writer and a teacher and a speaker, I added more words. <laughs> I added a subtitle, Racism Repair in the Church, Seven Lessons from an Evangelical Reject. That's me. Now, before you ask, no, I don't consider myself an evangelical. I call myself a black Christian. We can get more into that in the conversation after the talk. But for all intents and purposes, if you were to do a scientific, historical, sociological examination on paper, I'd be an evangelical. Now, you remember in, in, in uh, the uh, New Testament, Paul is saying, you know, if anybody has reasons to boast, I have more. He goes on and he talks about... Uh, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Well, in some ways, I'm an evangelical of evangelicals. I recited the sinner's prayer of the people of the seeker-sensitive movement in regard to the law, Reformed theologically. As for zeal, a critic of religious liberals. As for beliefs based on evangelicalism, faultless. That's a little remix of what Paul said. An evangelical of evangelicals. There's just one minor issue with the whole evangelical thing. In case you didn't notice, I don't just... We're black. I am black. As Beyonce said, I woke up like this. And I recently had a realization. I'll talk a little bit in a moment about uh, coming to faith in high school. And I recently had a realization 
that I do what I do and I promote racial justice, not because I've had such negative experiences of community and fellowship, but because I've had such good ones. And I think they can be even better. So, my mission is to reduce racism as a barrier to healthy community and identity. But to do that, I've had to learn some difficult lessons along the way. So we talk about seven lessons from an evangelical reject. Here's lesson number one. There's a difference between intent and impact. There's a difference between intent and impact. So, this is how much I like y'all. I'm going to show myself a picture of myself from high school. Thank goodness it's fuzzy. Here we are at a church. I don't know what the event is. Apparently we're singing, which was not a good idea to put a microphone in front of my face to sing. But I began my journey with Jesus in high school. I grew up in um, a nominally Christian family. It wasn't really a big topic of conversation in our house. And then I went to high school and I was in freshman health class with this guy named Christopher. We called him Toph. Wore these big, thick glasses, had a killer jump shot. I have no idea how he did it. Steve Kerr era kind of thing. And over time, this was like the classic evangelical conversion story. Friendship evangelism is what they called it. He developed a friendship with me. We just would talk about class and about sports and things like that over time. He's like, hey, on Wednesdays, I go to this gathering. We play basketball. We have food. It's a great time. You should come with. I'm like, okay. It's a youth group. And then, he was right. I mean, it was a good time. You know, in high school, you're all, we're all trying to find our place. You walk into the cafeteria, there's the, the, the table with the jocks, the, the drama kids over here, the cool kids over here. I didn't fit into any of them. But when I went to this youth group, I finally felt like I had a place to belong. I finally felt like, like I, I had a community. It was great. But to the extent I ever felt excluded, othered, misunderstood, it always had to do with race. But here's the thing. It's about, it's not about intent, it's about impact. So when I went to the group, nobody's calling me the N-word. Nobody's saying, you can't be on our team because you're black. It wasn't like that. The issue wasn't what they said, it's what they didn't say. It's not what they did, it's what they didn't do. When I went to this group, and not just the group, but even the church that was affiliated with this group, it, it was as if race didn't exist. Oh, everybody was on this colorblind thing. If we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. It's like when you play peekaboo with a baby. Babies don't know that, that, that when you leave their sight, it's still there. It's got to be right in their line of sight to exist. But guess what? If your church is almost all white, if your world is almost all white, then issues of race aren't going to be in your sight like they are for a black person. And so what was going on when I first became a Christian in this highly evangelical, mostly white context was race was invisible, race wasn't talked about, and I felt invisible. And when I say it, it's not about intent, it's about impact because I'm friends with Toph to this day, the youth pastor under whose preaching I was converted. We're friends to this day. They never once did anything malicious in terms of racism. That was never their intent. I would never ascribe that to them, but the impact was real. The impact was that I was in, but not of. 
evangelical-ish, you might say. The second lesson is that priestly proximity builds empathy. Priestly proximity builds empathy. So I go through high school. I become a leader in this youth group. My faith is serious. My conversion is real. I get to college at the University of Notre Dame. It's a Catholic school. Ironically enough, this is where I discover something called Reformed Theology. Same friend from high school gives me this book called Desiring God. And I'm reading through it. Shows you how serious a Christian I am. I'm reading extra books on top of my required books for class. I'm reading this book and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I've never quite heard this before. What drew me in, there was a Bible in there. There was a lot of scripture. And that was something I hadn't had as much of. It had been inculcated in me in high school, read your Bible every day, but like a theological breakdown kind of scratched that intellectual itch I had to learn more about the Bible and God. First Reformed church I went to was a Christian Reformed church, which I had no landscape for this, but CRC is Dutch, and they're even whiter than white evangelicalism. <laughs> I go to this Dutch church in South Bend, Indiana, and when I, I say mostly white, say, this was an all-white setting. I'm the only black person there. On top of it, I didn't know this, but the Dutch run tall. <laughs> and so I, I'm the only black person, and I'm like the shortest person aside from the seven-year-olds in the congregation. So this is all going on and this is all happening and I'm getting deeper and deeper into religion and faith and it's even in my mind as an undergrad, one day I'm gonna to go to seminary. So you how cool I was. My dream is to go to seminary, it's how cool. Um, then I graduate and I majored in American studies so my options were limited. I didn't know what I was gonna do but I knew I had a good education so I figured, well, I can teach. So I joined this group called Teach for America. And they send me to this planet on the far reaches of the galaxy called the Delta region of Arkansas. Talk about a culture shock. They assigned me to a brand new public charter school. I was a sixth grade science and social studies teacher. Uh, after all of five weeks of summer training, I was ready. <laughs> ready to be a teacher. Uh, and when I get down there, I'm confronted with a reality that I'd never been immersed in before. There was an article in 2019 from USA Today that looked at the median income of all the counties in the United States. And the county where I was, Phillips County, Arkansas, came in at the fourth poorest county in the country. I looked at some census data. The poverty rate in the state of Arkansas is about 16.3%, which is a little bit higher than the national average. The poverty rate in my town of Helena, Arkansas, was 43%. On top of that, the Delta region of both Arkansas and Mississippi the poorest region in each of those states, also the highest concentration of black people in each of those states. So overall in Arkansas, black people make up about 15.7% of the population. In the Delta, in Helena, black people are 77% of the population and growing because of white flight. And those two facts juxtaposed are not coincidental, you know. The poorest part of the state, the highest concentration of black people in the state, that's a history that dates all the way back to race-based chattel slavery when you needed more laborers than owners. And then sharecropping after that. And then mechanization, which, which puts a bunch of people out of their jobs in agriculture and concentrates poverty, which is replicated generation after generation until you get a place where nearly half of the population lives at or below the poverty line. And all of that is abstract, all of that is statistics, except when you're a teacher, all of those issues come walking in on two legs every day in the form of your students. 
So this is where I first learned about functional homelessness, where somebody could, could, could have a place to sleep at night, a roof over their heads, but it would be a different roof almost every night. We had one student, because of family instability due to another number of factors, he would alternately stay with his grandparents or a constellation of different relatives. Now, his grandparents were old school, and they made sure he did his homework, they made sure his uniform was clean every day. You could always tell when he had stayed with his grandparents because he would walk in refreshed, ready to go, in a better mood, but you could also tell when he stayed with some other relative because most of the time he came in wearing the same uniform that he had the day before, his homework wasn't done, he hadn't slept, he was in a bad mood. And for the longest time I couldn't figure out, you were this person on Tuesday and this person on Wednesday, what's going on until you get into their life situation and see what's happening. Attendance is a really big deal and because of the instability in these kinds of communities, absences and tardies are a big deal. So we would sometimes actually go do wellness checks, basically. And I remember going to one student's home in particular. He had been chronically late, chronically absent, and finally it was my turn to go check on the student. I knock on the door, and I hear this shuffling and scrambling but nobody answers. I can hear them in there, but nobody answers. I knock again, I wait. Finally, the door opens. It's not an adult that opens the door. It's a kid. It's not just one kid. It's four or five kids in various states of dress and undress like they had just woken up. And it's a school day. It's like 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. And they're all home, and... and the whole room is dark except for the glow from this massive TV in the living room. And from the glow of that TV, I can see through the crack of the door that the, the, the floor is just unfinished concrete, and then on the floor are two mattresses where apparently they'd all been sleeping. And I ask, hey, is, um, is Christopher here? It's a school day. You know how kids are. Ooh, Christopher, you're in trouble, you're in trouble. I said, is there an adult or a parent or a guardian here I can talk to? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So another couple of minutes passed by. Finally, this group of, they must have been late teens, early 20s max, comes out of this back room, have no idea what they'd been doing, answer the door. I tell them who I am. I'm a teacher from down the street. I'm checking on Charles. It's a school day. Is he coming to school? And they're like, oh, he told us he didn't have school today. Go get dressed, boy. Instances like this repeated over and over and over and over again. Not because these folks are lazy. You know, one of the things that angers me to no end is when people deny resources to the poor with the excuse that the poor are lazy. Do you know you have to work harder when you're poor than when you're wealthy? a lot harder. So it was not due to a lack of effort. It was not due to a lack of intelligence. It was due to systematic and programmatic disinvestment in this area over the course of decades. And when you're up close with that, my assignment was for two years in the classroom. I taught four years and then served another three years as a principal. When you're up close with that reality time and time again, it does something to you. It builds empathy. It gets you thinking about, well, how did these people who are so beautiful in so many ways, so capable, so intelligent, get in a situation like this? It gets you thinking about justice. And as a Christian, I started to ask, well, what does my faith have to say about these issues of real material justice. And in the reformed and evangelical tradition I was in, I find it didn't have much to say at all. Incredibly frustrating. Again, because I like you. <laughs> this is real. I was a principal. Look like a baby.
visiting the students' houses, getting to know their families, being in this area of high poverty, which by the way, there's incredible wealth there, but it's relational wealth. It's the tight knit of the community. It's the fact that everyone figures out a way to take care of everyone else that I learned to discover the riches in a place of material poverty. It's a beautiful place. Supposed to be there for two years, spent about 20 years there. But what happened was priestly proximity builds empathy. I think a lot of the problem that we have in terms of justice is because folk don't know folk. The poor, the marginalized, the oppressed are an abstraction. And they're not in your world. So you don't have real empathy, let alone action on behalf of the oppressed if you don't have what I call priestly proximity, priestly in the sense of, of, of caring for, ministering to, serving, and proximity, that you're close, that you're near enough to see what their reality is like and how it might differ from yours. Priestly proximity builds empathy. There's another lesson. Lesson number three, we're gonna camp here for a minute. There's a difference between racial reconciliation and racial justice. Now, first of all, I ain't mad if you use the term racial reconciliation, depending on what you mean by it. Over time and through difficult experience, I, I came to focus on racial justice. So my second book, How to Fight Racism, subtitled Courageous Christianity and the Journey Toward Racial Justice. We talk about repair. In some senses, you could say that justice is another word for repair. There's a difference in evangelical circles between reconciliation and justice, between racial reconciliation and racial justice, I came to find out. So one of the things you've got to know is that at this time, so I was a, a, a middle school teacher and principal, total of seven years, then in 2011, I, I go and fulfill my high school college dream and enroll in seminary. Thankfully, I was married by this time, so I didn't have to look cool, because I don't know who would have been on board with the, I'm going to go to seminary. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, and at this time, I'm waving the banner for evangelicalism. I'm waving the banner for Reformed theology. I'm literally, okay, so I go to Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, as part of like my student work, I get assigned to uh, the admissions office. And while I'm in admissions, uh, I come up with this idea called the African American Leadership Initiative. When I got to RTS, you could count on one hand the number of black American students there. And we were in Jackson, Mississippi, which has the second highest proportion of black people of any city over 100,000 in the entire United States. It's 80% black. Jackson is Chocolate City, which, by the way, as a bonus, is not unrelated from its current water problems, but, it, you know. So we're in Jackson. I'm like, we should have more black students. So I start this thing called AALI. A couple months after that, I get this idea, okay, there's not a lot of black people in Reformed theology, but I think there, there might be space where there might be room at the table. So I start this thing called the Reformed African American Network. The old G's that have uh, been riding with me for a long time remember RAN, R-A-A-N. This was an incredible time. I'm literally, through admissions, recruiting people to come to seminary at RTS. And if I'm honest with you, That part of my story is one of the ones that I continue to wrestle with the most. Because I invited people into a space that wasn't ready for them. I conveyed to them that this would be a place where they could be healthy and flourish and really, it was a place that had the strong risk of racial trauma. 
because it wasn't ready for them. I'm still talking to Jesus about that and what to do about that, but I'm waving the banner at this point. What I didn't know was something called the white evangelical toolkit. All right, we're talking about this idea of racial reconciliation versus racial justice. Here's what I think is one of the fundamental divides between how black and white Christians think about race. And if we could somehow get white folks on the same page with this, I think it would make a dramatic difference. So this comes from uh, Michael Emerson and Christian Smith, their book, Divided by Faith. And they talk about the white evangelical toolkit, and there are three central ideas in this sort of uh, mental, even theological toolkit that actually make it harder for white people to work for racial justice. The first idea is accountable individualism. Accountable individualism, which says individuals exist independent of structures and institutions. They have free will and are individually accountable for their own actions. Okay, fair enough. We're going to get to how that relates to race in a moment. Relationalism, a strong emphasis on interpersonal relationships. Sounds kind of good. What's the problem with that? We'll talk about it. Anti-structuralism, invoking social structures in their belief, shifts guilt away from its source, the accountable individual. Accountable individualism, you're only an individual, you exist independent of structures and systems, you're accountable for all your own choices and actions without necessarily your context making much of a difference. What happens is this, they interpret the Bible, don't realize you have a socio-cultural context because you're an accountable individual, so your interpretation of the Bible is just what's right and it is not historically, contextually informed. And so when a black person comes along with a different biblical interpretation or application, they say, that's woke. That's unbiblical. Because most white people don't recognize that you have a culture too. And you do your biblical interpretation out of that culture. And that doesn't even have to be bad in and of itself as long as you recognize it and then value the, value, the, the importance of different perspectives. Relationalism, a strong emphasis on personal relationships. Y'all, fighting racism takes more than handshakes and hugs. It takes more than a pulpit swap. It takes more than a heart-to-heart -heart conversation over a cup of coffee or tea where we pour out our life stories and just share and hug it out at the end. That's what so many white Christians think is racial reconciliation. That's what so many white people think is what we need to do about racism. We just need to get to know each other more. I was on stage one time at a huge evangelical conference. I was part of a panel of speakers and one of the speakers was a pastor of a large white church in Memphis, and, and, and he said, you know, if our sons and daughters can get married across racial lines, then we'll know we will have achieved something. <sighs> Talk about the burnout part. Some of you are thinking, well, what's wrong with that? That is an achievement. Eh, yeah, maybe. I mean, it shouldn't be illegal, which it was until the 60s but that's not gonna do anything to help the kids and families I was working with in the Delta. That's not gonna do anything to strengthen black churches which were decimated financially by COVID. It doesn't do anything about the systems and the structures and the policies that create injustice. But in the white evangelical toolkit, it's all about relationships and anti-structuralism that invoking social structures, like the laws we pass, the segregation that is still an issue today, that actually, in their view, shifts responsibility away from the accountable individual. So to bring up any idea of systemic racism is seen as off limits. And now that we've passed 
the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 uh, uh, Voting Rights Act, the 68 Fair Housing Act, now that these laws about segregation are off the books, you can't talk about systemic racism anymore in the minds of many white Christians. So I had to learn the hard way that when they said racial reconciliation, they weren't talking about systems or structures. They were, counting, they were talking about individuals and relationships and anti-structuralism. And if you can go back and talk about one thing to your relatives, your friends, your social network, talk about this! So it's about this time that we, we start talking about something called Black Lives Matter. Now, I don't know if you know the backstory of that phrase, but it actually starts in 2013. So what happened was in 2012, a black teenager named Trayvon Martin gets killed for being the wrong color in the wrong neighborhood. And you remember the, the, the conversation around this. Barack Obama, who was president at the time, said if I had a son, it would look, he would look a lot like Trayvon Martin. People just lost it. Well, how dare he bring race into the presidency? Whew. Those were some days. Um, <laughs> so then what happens, Trayvon Martin is killed his killer is put on trial. Then in 2013, his killer is acquitted under the stand your ground laws in Florida. And that's when Black Lives Matter is born. One of the activists, Alicia Garza, goes on Facebook. And she says, black people, I love you. I love us. Our lives matter. One of her association, associates picks up on that language, and Paris, Patrice Cullors said, Declaration! Black bodies will no longer be sacrificed for the rest of the world's enlightenment. I am done. I am so done. You are loved infinitely. Hashtag Black Lives. That's when the hashtag was born. Isn't it so interesting that black people waited until the justice system played itself out? We weren't in the streets upon the murder of Trayvon Martin, which we justifiably could have been. We said, let's see what the process brings about. And a year later, he's acquitted. Nobody's at fault that this black teenager is dead. And in the midst of that grief, of that weight, of that heaviness, we say, I'm sick of it. I'm done. We matter infinitely. Black lives matter. And that's a theological statement. Black lives matter is an expression of lament. It's a prayer. It's a psalm. It is a heart cry that says, Black Lives Matter! Don't they, God? How long, O oh Lord? How long will you allow our sons and daughters to be killed by the people charged with protecting them? Black Lives Matter is a lament. Black Lives Matter is also an affirmation of the Imago Dei and people of African descent to say, we too are made in the image and likeness of God and black is beautiful. And if you didn't know it, God said so. And so you can imagine the sense of betrayal we as black people had when we said black lives matter and the retort was all lives matter. First of all, listen, tell all your friends. Black lives matter doesn't mean only black lives matter. Black Lives Matter means Black Lives Matter too, as well as, in addition to all lives. 
You can imagine the frustration that when we said black lives matter, they said blue lives matter, which we know is a lie because of what happened on January 6th, BT dubs. I got a lot of this, y'all. I'm just giving you the, woo, we got so much bonus material. Um, <laughs> and I'm taking this personally, God, because I'm waving the banner. I'm in an intentionally multiracial, though still predominantly white Presbyterian church in America, PCA church. I'm an intern. I'm under care to get ordained in the PCA where only 1% of teaching elders are black. I'm going to Reformed Theological Seminary. Reformed is on as far white of the spectrum as you can get. I'm recruiting for the seminary. I'm on the church planting committee at church. And all of this is happening. And that's not even it. Because then comes the 2016 election. Ooh, the hits keep coming. Y'all remember that number? You know, it might be 80 for 81 for whatever. An extreme majority of white evangelicals, when they voted, pulled the lever for Donald Trump. Do you remember, like, so we often in our minds place the date November 2016 because that's when the election was, but he announced his candidacy in May of 2015 came down the escalators at Trump Towers and declared his candidacy by calling some Mexican immigrants racist. I mean, that was just a hint of what was to come, right? And we don't have to go through it all. We should know it by now. But what did that do in the church? There's a quote by Michael Emerson, who I referenced before. It said, the election itself was the single most harmful event to the whole movement of reconciliation in at least the past 30 years. It's about to completely break apart. The single most harmful event to the whole movement of reconciliation. You were talking all this stuff about racial reconciliation and then four out of five white evangelicals pull the lever for this man. And I don't know what the conversation was in your churches, but among black folks, it was like, oh, I see what we're dealing with now. I remember watching the election results roll in on election night, and I think it was after midnight until they finally declared, and I was sitting in the dark and alone in, in, in the living room and just watching with this sense of impending dread. And the next day, my, my, my podcast producer calls me up and he's like, hey, do you have some thoughts that you want to share on the mic? I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll talk about it. Not knowing was, what was about to come. There was one particular line as I'm just sharing what is not controversial to most black people. This is one thing you got to understand. Stuff that we talk about in terms of race that is like so incendiary in white context ain't nothing in black context. What I was saying was not controversial, was not radical, was not anything but what most of us felt. And so that's what I was sharing on Mike. And I said, quite honestly, on that episode, I said that that Sunday, I did not feel safe worshiping in my predominantly white evangelical church. I said I didn't feel safe. And I meant it. I didn't mean I didn't feel physically safe. I meant I didn't feel emotionally or spiritually safe. These people had held my infant child in their arms, had prayed with me, had sang with me, we'd shared meals together. I thought we were a community. But as soon as they walked into that voting booth, it was as if I didn't exist. That my concerns weren't important. That me, in their mixed with proximity, none of that made a difference. And so I didn't feel safe. Well, a self-styled apologist on the internet listened to this. I can only imagine just to do what he did, which was an hour-long YouTube video, a takedown of everything that I had said. 
So he gets on there. My very kind colleague went back and listened to it. So there's a bunch of quotes. Here's one. How does anyone get away with saying this kind of stuff, he says. I'll be honest with you, Jamar. I find that absolutely sinful. That's a sinful attitude. I won't buy the narrative. Do you feel the righteous indignation there? How dare I say I don't feel safe in a white church that's racist, that's divisive. Maybe you're thinking that same thing too. Just keep on keeping on. One day you'll understand. Just because it's the church doesn't mean it's not toxic. Haven't we learned that yet? That was just the beginning. So he did this YouTube video, and then what I didn't realize, the reason why this sticks out in my mind is the first time one person had said something and then all his minions glommed on. For the next three weeks straight was a constant stream of some of the most vile, heinous, disrespectful things that you could say to another human being. Every time I logged on, another comment, another social media post, another video, memes of black people looking like monkeys in cages, calling, being called the N-word. It got to the point, I talked about weathering earlier, it got to the point that my eye would twitch, the muscle in my eye would twitch every time I, I logged on to social media just anticipating the attacks that were coming. I started to learn there's a difference between racial reconciliation and racial justice. Do you know there's a safe way to talk about race in evangelical circles? As long as you talk about relationships and getting to know one another and, hey, let's have a speaker here and there. But when it comes to repair, when it comes to systems and structures, when it comes to the voting booth, don't talk about race anymore. You've crossed the line, pushed out. And that did. That started my process of pushing out. At, at, at some point, I don't know when it became pushing out and me just turning around and saying, all right, peace. But that started my exit from these places I was so deeply embedded in. The church I was in, the denomination I was in, the seminary I was in, the job I'd gotten at the seminary for starting the African American Leadership Initiative. All of that eventually gone. But it's not just those formal institutional ties that were gone. It was relationships that were gone. Friendships that had been built. A revelation of how far I could really trust people, how much they really knew and understood about me. Not just about racial reconciliation. It's about racial justice, and there's a difference. And that taught me the next lesson. Sometimes you got to build your own table. I told you that in the fall of 2011, we started something called the Reformed African American Network. Y'all, this thing is rocking. 2012, we launched our website, which meant we could control the narrative up to that point. We had just been posting things on Facebook or doing guest uh, uh, blog posts on some predominantly white evangelical outlet. Then we had our own website, which means we could tell our own stories in our own way. Then in 2013, we start this podcast called Pass the Mic, which is still going strong. 2023 is the 10 year anniversary. Oh, my God. Thank you for the blessing. You should subscribe. Um, but. What was happening was we were in their midst because we claimed that reformed label, which they claimed ownership of. See, here's the thing. If you don't realize, black people are invisible to most white people until we're in white spaces. Y'all don't know what's going on in black churches, by and large. But when a black person comes to your white church, that's when some conversations start to happen, some awareness, not in general, it's about that individual or that family or whatever. But what was happening with the Reformed African American Network was they thought we were in their territory as if they owned theology. 
And because we were in their territory, they made a big stink about it. Because now we're talking about Black Lives Matter. Now we're talking about the history of policing. Now we're talking about redlining. Now we're talking about ongoing forms of racial prejudice. And what was happening was we were spending all of our time doing what I call racial apologetics, making the case that racism is real. And meanwhile, the black folks are actually being left behind because you don't have to make the case to most black folks that racism is real. So what did we do? I remember summer 2017, we all gathered in Jackson, Mississippi, and we had a retreat. And our big question at the retreat was, do we change our name? Do we send a bat signal to the world that we are no longer dealing with white foolishness around denying racism? And so we did. The Reformed African American Network became the witness of Black Christian Collective. We're witnessing to our experience as Black Christians. Still going today. You can go to thewitnessbcc.com to check out our stuff. We started a foundation called the Witness Foundation, which we'll talk more about, but $100,000 to Black Christian leaders over the course of two years in a fellowship program from people who already don't have money. But anyway, we changed the name, we changed the logo, because I learned the lesson that sometimes you have to build your own table. See, sometimes you can get in the room, sometimes you can sit at the table, but what happens is they value our presence, but not our perspective. They value our faces, but not our feelings. They like our attendance, but not our experiences. And so sometimes you have to build your own table. There was one other lesson that I learned, that justice takes sides. Another one of the things that really frustrates me about this whole racial conversation is that so many times it's a both sides thing. Well, black people and white people, they both did some wrong, and we just need to be forgiving and meet in the middle. Or there's a false equivalency. Well, this thing on this side isn't right, and this thing on this side isn't right, and they're both equally wrong. Doesn't work like that with racism or injustice. There's a victim and there's a victimizer. There's an oppressed and an oppressor, which is Bible language. You'll see on the internet all the time, oh, to say that word oppressed, that's critical race theory. No, nah, that's Bible. Go look it up. I ain't making it up. Check the receipts. Justice takes sides. First of all, you got to be hit to gain. All right. Some of y'all know this figure, Christopher Rufo. I'll let you know. So what's so interesting about Rufo is that he, he, he reveals the game plan. In a series of tweets, he said, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. This is how you make critical race theory a boogeyman. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. He told us. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. He laid out the whole playbook and millions are falling for it hook, line, and sinker. By the way, when you watch this, Rufo, we're on to you, and we're not scared. <laughs> Let me tell you some of the negative ramifications of this anti-CRT crusade. A lot of folks came to know me not because of my books, but because of this saga with Grove City College. That's their board of trustees, by the way. 
I went and spoke at Grove City College, which is a conservative Christian college, and their subtitle on this graphic says, because faith and freedom matter. I went and spoke October 2020, just a couple of weeks before the election. And I gave a series of talks. Mysteriously, the, the, the afternoon talk that I gave is not recorded or posted anywhere, which the organizer of the event said had never happened before. But my chapel talk is recorded and should still be available online. I gave a very accessible talk on racial justice. But it was still woke, apparently. So what had happened was, I went there in 2020, it was tense but polite, and I left. I'll go if you invite me. Maybe you need to hear what I have to say. So I went in good faith, had this experience, left, thought not much more of it until a year later, there is a petition online called Save GCC from CRT. In that petition by parents and alumni, they pointed to several signs that Grove City College, which is about as conservative as you can get, was going woke, was succumbing to CRT, and as one of the points of evidence, they cited my speaking there. Now, th none of this so far is out of the range of my experience. There's always an article, a conversation, a blog post after I come to these places, so I'm used to that. What was different this time? is that it rose all the way to the level of the Board of Trustees. And as a result, the Board of Trustees named a special committee to investigate so-called mission drift at the school. And this select committee from the Board of Trustees came up with this 20-some-odd page report. I'm a college professor, y'all. This report was a D minus because I felt bad for you for flunking you. Like Esau said in the talk, these folks are not intellectually serious. They went and made a case to, to support their preconceived notion, and in that report they named me. Now, I expected this report to eventually be adopted, but I thought there would be some revisions, some revise and resubmit, but no. The Board of Trustees officially adopted this report and... One of the things that they said was this. The Jamar Tisby that we thought we invited in 2019 is not the Jamar Tisby that we heard in 2020 or that we now read about. They allow that in hindsight. Inviting Mr. Tisby to speak in chapel was a mistake. Oh, <laughs> y'all don't did it now. Because the Board of Trustees officially adopted this, this now becomes the official stance of Grove City College. That it was a mistake to invite me. So a couple of things. Number one, a mistake to invite me to speak in chapel. This is what I call theological paternalism. Because what they were saying was, well, maybe we could have heard him in the context of a classroom where there's intellectual debate, but not in chapel. Because the theological insights derived from the black experience about race are not orthodox. Shouldn't be listened to. The other thing that happened was, I spoke up. Usually I don't do this. If it's a one-off, it's an individual, if it's a small group of people, if it's informal, if it's grassroots, but this is official. The official stance of the college now was that it was a mistake to invite me, and what they did to me was nothing compared to what they did to their own faculty and staff. And I name Grove City, but there's multiple colleges out there that have now branded themselves and staked their future on being not woke and anti-CRT. So this is only going to increase. But I spoke up because this is now an institutional stance, and I was thinking about this quote. We must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. Justice.
take a side. Um, so I did a series of posts on my Substack, and we ultimately did a podcast series called Those Meddling Kids Understanding the Anti-CRT Crusade. And we talked to experts about what was happening, what critical race theory is. Every single episode of this 10 episode series, we have an expert define what critical race theory is. So don't ever buy the lie that we never define it. And also, <laughs> most of the people who get accused of CRT are not CRT scholars. That's, like, that's a legal theory they teach in law school. The conclusions I come to about race is because I study history. So you're foisting a label on people who haven't even studied the theory. But if you study history, my, my, my. Lesson six, and we're almost done. <laughs> I appreciate that. Lesson six, go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. Shout out to my co-host, Tyler Burns, on the mic. Go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. Y'all, what I didn't know for years was that all of my energy, all of my gifts, all of my skills were being poured out in environments where they merely tolerated my presence. And there's such a big difference being at a place where they tolerate you versus being at a place where they celebrate you. There are studies that show if you do something like fly first class on an airplane, you're never satisfied again with coach. <laughs> like, you'll endure it, but you know what could be. And that's the same thing with being tolerated versus celebrated. Once you've experienced what it feels like to be celebrated for who you are, you can never be satisfied with merely being tolerated. That's what I learned. So, in 2018, the New York Times published an article called A Quiet Exodus, Why Black Worshippers Are Leaving White Evangelical Churches. A Quiet Exodus. In that article, they chronicled the plight of black Christians who quietly exited their churches after their pastors and fellow believers failed to denounce state-sanctioned violence against black people, white Christian nationalism, systemic racism, and everyday bigotry. And since that time, things have gotten worse, not better. And so, in the spring of 2021, we had seen a surge of black leaders and congregants in predominantly white or multi-ethnic churches and Christian spaces decide that it was time for them to go. And in an effort to bear witness to the hurt, the harm, and the frustration that our siblings have experienced, we said it's time to leave loud. Leave loud is meant to tell our stories to name things for what they are, and to take back the dignity that has been attempted to be stolen, being in institutions that don't value the fullness of the image of God within us, and, where, and to go where we are celebrated, not tolerated. Leave Loud was our taking our voices back. Leave Loud is our taking our stories back. Leave Loud is our taking our experiences back. Leave loud is to say we will not take injustice, abuse, oppression, racism silently. And it's meant especially for black Christians who are exiting white Christian spaces, but I think there's broad applicability. And I think a lot of people are wrestling right now with whether to stay or whether to leave. To which I will say, when people show you who you are, who they are, believe them the first time. When people show you who they are, believe them the first time. But leave loud has a pedagogical purpose. When we tell our stories, it puts responsibility and accountability on the institution to deal with the harm that they've caused. If they don't know they've harmed you, how can they repair it? And many institutions have chosen not to repair it, but now it's on them, because they know the story. 
Some institutions, because they've heard of the hurt and the harm toward black people that they may have unintentionally caused, but remember, it's not intention, it's impact, then they undertake steps to repair. But if we don't tell our stories, we never give the institution even the opportunity to change. Secondly, and this goes back to my wrestling with recruiting black people into spaces that weren't safe for them. Our very presence in white institutions signals to other black people that maybe it's okay for them too. And if we keep the stories of hurt and harm to ourselves, then they will enter these spaces unguarded and vulnerable. So us leaving loud and telling our stories actually signals to other black people and other people of color and our allies that, hey, maybe this institution isn't ready for your brilliance. And that's what it is. Black folks, we have got to assert our dignity. We do not need to negotiate our dignity. Who was it that said, I think it was Du Bois, he had gotten some honor, and he said, I think it was from Harvard, and he said, the pleasure is theirs. <laughs> Black people, my longing for us is that we would walk into any predominantly white institution and say, the pleasure is yours that I'm here. <laughs> you got to understand, white folks, that in a white supremacist society, we're coming in at a deficit of dignity. And so we actually have to assert our dignity in ways you may feel uncomfortable with to counteract the negative impacts of racism and white supremacy. It's your pleasure that we're here. But sometimes you have to leave loud. And one more thing I'll say on that is that we often weaponize unity. People say, don't leave, don't go. How will we ever survive without you? We need your voice, we need your presence. I've shared on social media recently, we have weaponized unity in the church. We often use it as a bludgeon to keep those who have been injured silent about the harm they've endured and to guilt trip people into staying among toxic people who are more committed to themselves than to Christ. You know how many times I've been told but Jamar, if, if you don't stay, how will we ever learn? Your learning can't come at the cost of my life, my health, my dignity, my family. We've weaponized unity to say that anytime we talk about our own unique experiences as, as black people or other people groups, we're being divisive. That if we would just stop talking about it, we could be unified. No, that's not unity, that's uniformity. That's not acceptance, that's assimilation. Sometimes you have to leave loud to go where you're not just celebrated, but tolerated. And I'll say this, I didn't plan it, but God is so sweet, so good. I had been pushed out of so many white Christian spaces, relationships, communities. I felt like I was in the wilderness wandering. Then out of the blue on August 5th comes a text message. A friend of mine says, hey, there's this person who works at Simmons College. Their president wants to talk to you. Simmons College, where's that? A day later, a professor from there texts me and said, hey, can I share your number with our college president? An hour after that text message, I get a phone call from President Kevin W. Cosby. In our very first, listen, this is a master class in recruitment. Y'all, he was, I had no chance. He calls me up, and in the first phone call, he says, Doc, we want you. This is your Macedonian call. Come on over and help us. <laughs> he doesn't call me just once. He calls me again an hour later with another professor on the phone. He says, I don't want you to hear how great Simmons is just for me. I want you to talk to somebody who works here and get their testimony. I'm going to leave you all to have a conversation. Three weeks later, I went up for a visit. Done deal. 
Every time I talk to Dr. Cosby, who was born and raised in a black neighborhood, pastors the largest black congregation in the state of Kentucky, he tells me, I'm so proud of you, man. He says, you, you a historical gangster. <laughs> when I tell you when you have a taste of being celebrated, you will never tolerate merely being tolerated again. Go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. Now, we come close to the end of our journey. We've had six lessons so far. There's a difference between intent and impact. Priestly proximity builds empathy. There's a difference between racial reconciliation and racial justice. Build your own table. Justice takes sides and go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. But there's one more lesson from an evangelical reset, reject, and it's this one. Be strong and courageous. It, it, it still baffles me that uh, anyone looks at my journey and gets anything from it, because you know, when you're in it, you know it, it doesn't feel special. You know all of the struggles you're going through. You know how weak you are. But I think if there's anything that people observe about my journey and respect or want to emulate, is that at certain critical moments, I had the courage to step out on faith. I had the courage to say, I'm going to lose something, but God has something better. And so I don't have like a life verse or something like that, but there is a passage of scripture I keep coming back to again and again and again over the years. It's Joshua chapter one, verses one through nine. This is when Joshua is taking over, leading the people of Israel into the promised land. And I love how this passage starts in verse two. God starts with a plain statement of fact. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. You got to love God's honesty sometimes. He's like, this is the reality. Ain't no sense in trying to soften it up. This is what you got to deal with. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now it's up to you. What you going to do? And in those short nine verses, God says, not once, not twice, but three different times, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous, be strong and courageous. That's so interesting to me. God didn't say, go study your Bible. Go get a committee together and figure out a plan. God said, in order to go to the place I've promised to you, you're going to need to be strong and courageous. But here's the beautiful part. God doesn't just tell Joshua, be strong and courageous. God gives Joshua a promise. Have I not commanded you yes, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. That's the promise that comes with being strong and courageous. Y'all, I don't know how to express it. I only got one sermon in my whole repertoire. It's be strong and courageous because when you do, you're going to find out for sure that you know that you know that you know that God is with you wherever you go. I can't, I, can't, I can't sit here and explain it to you in words. You can only sense the presence of God in this close, intimate way if you step out in strength and courage beyond what is comfortable, beyond what is safe, beyond what is socially acceptable, and stand up for righteousness' sake. And when you do that, you sense God's nearness. I love that God is so expansive, God needs many names. And one of the names is Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. You see how good God is? God didn't just make a promise. God turned that promise into a person whose name is Jesus. And y'all, if you want a closer walk with Jesus, then you need to step up and be strong and courageous. I don't know why, as Christians, we are so like wringing our hands about racial justice. Y'all, you're not wrong. 
You're on God's side. Remember Joshua 5? Are you for us or for our enemy? No, but I'm the angel of the Lord. Okay, I want to be on your side, God. When you stand up for racial justice and righteousness, you're on God's side. So what are you timid about? What are you afraid about? Why are you walking into the meeting like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to say? Why are you typing the post like, oh, I don't know how people are going to receive it? What are you afraid of? Are you serious right now? Jesus is in you. God is with you. you who shall you fear? As they say, say it with your chest. You don't got to be afraid. God commands us, be strong and courageous. But he also says, I'll be with you wherever you go. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you.